Um, I suppose what I should say up front is um, draw your attention to the little line at the bottom, especially if you belong to um, the um, journalistic craft here. I do work for an ISP, but this in no way reflects the views of that ISP. Um, yeah. And it's traditional amongst us networking folk to start a talk with the um, ISO model. And um, so most of the technical stuff I'll be talking about is here. And most of the other stuff I'll be talking about is further up near the top there. Um, basically, people are only interested in IPv6 because we're getting to the end of IPv4 addresses. Otherwise, there'd be very little point to the thing. Um, so I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover what's likely to happen when we run out of IPv4 addresses. Then I'll cover IPv6 as one of the solutions to that and the problems people have had with deploying IPv6. And hopefully we'll fit that into 40 minutes. Um, this is the next traditional slide at a talk about IPv6 that shows the um, address exhaustion. As you can see, there's a date here, 2011, 2010, 2012. Take your own pick there. Uh, the gentleman writing, I think. You're quite tall and un unfortunately positioned. <laughs> um, this is Jeff Houston's slide. Um, there is a joke that he puts the date on it so you can tell how late last night um, things were written. Uh, this is a very fresh... <laughs> um, the thing to notice is that the re address registries are in the time that we're purchasing systems for now are going to run out of addresses. That, that's the important point of this slide. And that happens in this sort of time frame. When that happens and you want to get a new IPv4 address and you approach APNIC, they'll say the cupboard is bare. Um, we have a plan to fix that. Uh, it's a long-lived plan, dates from about 94, and we're going to replace IPv4 by IPv6. And then we'll throw IPv4 away. Um, this is how well our plan is doing as of last year. Uh, this is the percentage of internet traffic used for IPv6. Um, yeah, y you'll notice how many decimal places to the right we are. <laughs> so it's um, very fair to say that the plan has failed. Um, and some people have come out and said that, so I don't need to be quoted as saying that myself. Okay, we have no plan B. Oh, no, no. Um, there is a plan B being thought up as we talk. That, that's the proper way of putting it. Um, this plan is called carrier class NAT. That is that we'll simply run NAT within the ISP. We'll give customers a um, address out of Network 10, probably not even a unique address out of that, and we'll continue on our merry way. Um, it's not a great plan. Uh, for starters, it gets rid of end-to-end -end visibility or the remnants of end-to-end -end visibility that we currently have in the internet. Um, that has some obvious user visible effects, most of which real users won't notice anyway because they can't do that from their home ADSL router anyway at the moment. Um, it also breaks end-to-end -end connectivity to your site. That's more of a problem if you think you might want to run a web server from home, uh, receive an IP phone call, that sort of thing. Um, I put a bit in here about how NAT works. Uh, I'm not sure if that's preaching to the converted. Uh, it's reasonably important to understand how it works, to understand the economic effects of NAT. Um, essentially, we inspect the outgoing traffic and we record it in a table. Um, and then we rewrite it. it. It's pretty straightforward. You'll notice that there's two things happening there. Firstly, there's a deep, what we call a deep packet inspection. That is a costly inspection of traffic, and we add it to a table. This is what in the trade we call hard state. If you lose this, this connection disappears. This, in turn, is of limited scale and can be easily dosed. Um, you're starting to get the feeling about how robust this NAT solution is going to be. Um, and then when the traffic comes back through, we do another DPI. We look to see if it's in the expectation table, and we either reject or rewrite it. 
Um, life's never that simple. Uh, as well as rewriting the addresses in the headers, sometimes we need to rewrite the addresses in the protocols themselves. Sometimes those protocols give us a hint of traffic to come. For example, we'll have a telephony control protocol that says you can shortly expect a connection on this port, and the same is true of FTP. Um, sometimes looking inside that package is extraordinarily expensive, as with SNMP, um, and full of bugs to boot. Um, yeah. For each of those, we need a specialist NAT module. And if you don't incorporate that NAT module, that pro protocol will not work properly. Um, from an ISP point of view, this sucks like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> we like to do our forwarding plane in ASIC, right? What I've just described is a complex thing. It's not an ASIC task, right? Um, these things are open to a stack of jitter and a stack of complexity, and that both of those are exploitable by nasty people. Um, this code is massive. Just decoding an ASM1 packet is a big ask, right? It's going to have errors. People are going to be able to hack at the forwarding plane of our routers. This is not a position an ISP likes to be in. Um, these things have huge amounts of state carried with them, again, giving people a chance, an opportunity to hack at the forwarding plane of our routers. Usually when we have state in the forwarding plane, that is about, for example, with the multicast protocols, something that we can listen to and renew. So if we're under attack, we just empty that table out. And we don't care because the valid users will replace that state in time. They'll undergo a short outage while that happens, but that state will reappear. These are what we call soft state protocols, right? If we change the route through the network of that traffic, that state will be instanted along that route, right? With hard state protocols, that state exists, and it exists on one path through the network only. So getting that state across to our backup path requires yet another set of exploitable protocols to have an A and a B in sync. Um, the other problem is that all this hard state, because we're trying to keep the table size down, because it's not infinite, comes with timeouts. And some devices these days don't want to talk every five minutes and send a packet. Um, especially with my more scientific users, they want to wake a box whenever the event happens, not whenever the network needs it. Um, that's particularly true of um, sensor networks, where you know they're just trying to run off a little solar panel. Uh, they're not really going to be NAT people. Um, so because we lack visibility end to end, all the protocols that are finding each other protocols um, aren't going to work. Peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which will make some people happy. Um, teleconferencing and other multimedia like phone calls. Um, so what we're going to have to do is build an overlay network, have little servers so that these things can find each other. Right? There are various attempts to generalize those overlay networks, but from an ISP's point of view, and that's where I stand, they look remarkably like onion routers. You know, you send a packet in here and it goes to this router and is rewritten, this router is rewritten, this router is rewritten, and back through. And we're cautious about them anyway because of their tradition of misuse. So what we're going to see happen on top of our networks is a set of overlay networks and then an abundance of misuse that comes with those. Those overlay networks don't follow the topology either. And that's a real problem if you're in a latency sensitive application. Now, everybody in this room runs a latency sensitive application called TCP because it's 90 milliseconds to the US West Coast and then another 90 back. And TCP woefully underperforms in that scenario, um, not helped by other operating system stacks. The Linux one's actually very good. Um, but latency is the performance issue. So putting an overlay architecture over a network that doesn't match the network topology is just asking for underperformance, which is why I've got this game, right? If you're in the latency sensitive application, you want to get out of V4 as quick as you can. Um, I was saying that this thing has economic effects, and they're not good. Um, the first thing is that everyone that hosts stuff off their ADSL router currently will have to move that to a hosting service. That is, to people who can afford to buy IPv4 addresses because they're buying them in bulk. Um, that, again, leads to pricing issues. 
Um, it's also possible, and again, I must make the point that I'm not talking for my ISP, or any ISP in particular, that by not providing a NAT module for some services that like, that need it, I could force you to use my service. And top of that list, of course, is um, support for SIP and H323, where I want to push you towards my traditional expensive telephony infrastructure. And I can write a fine paper to the regulators to cover us saying, oh, you know, all this traffic's moving to the internet and it's becoming less and less robust and we're providing a top class, triple O, capable, 911 if you're from the US, capable infrastructure. Um, I think an Australian ISP will try that one on. <laughs> I'm being taped, I don't want to be sued. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen once we run out of V4 addresses is that if you have a large historical application for, sorry, a large historical allocation of V4 addresses, you're going to be sitting on a pot of money. Um, so if you think that I have a large historical allocation and I'll be fine, you don't know university vice chancellors very well. <laughs> um, the other problem with these large historical applications allocations is that there's very poor record keeping of them. Those records that are there aren't kept up to point, up to date. ISP contracts barely discuss address allocation at all since it's just one of those things that happen operationally. It's not an asset you're giving away except for in three years time. Um, and so there's ample scope for selling bridges. Um, who wants a class B? Oh, all right, there you go. <laughs> and sell another one over here and don't worry that it's in use already over there. Um, the internet route registries themselves are trying to position themselves as the registry of record for um, IP address transactions. Uh, I think myself that given their past behaviour where they said that IPv4 addresses are definitely positively not tradable, that that's an interesting turnabout. <laughs> um, but I'm not even sure that that infrastructure will be in place in time, to be honest. Um, for ISPs, it, it's a different kettle of fish again. The, the allocation and the advertisement of prefixes are two distinct things, right? And it's only really a, I was going to say gentleman's agreement, but I'm not sure what the modern phrase for that is. Um, between ISPs that say that the two match, just in sa the same way that we have a gentleman's agreement about the IP addresses used for DNS zones. So if, if you're a very large and particularly rapacious ISP, you may choose not to advertise particular IPv4 addresses and simply gazump them for yourself, knowing that since you're one of the two largest ISPs in the world, the rest of the world will have to follow you anyway. Um, so it's not particularly clear to me how much the registries will matter. Um, the other thing is, from an ISP's point of view, as we scrape the bottom of the barrel and we start adding slash 26s and so on, and where we used to have one slash 16, we now have however many slash 24s, the routing table size that, that has been static for a very long time is going to suddenly kick up again. Um, that might seem to you to be a minor thing. For us ISPs, that's a major thing because, for example, the Juniper... M series architecture and their T series architecture, keep that table in a fixed size static RAM. And if you run out of that static RAM, you've run out and you're up for a new router. Um, for those of us sitting on large historical application, allocations, going back to what I was saying about overlay networks, you are sitting on hacker's paradise. Everyone that wants to establish an overlay network will want one of your addresses. So if that address isn't secured, somebody will use it for on your behalf. <laughs> so whereas in, la whereas in years gone past we've seen a decline in the amount of hacking aimed at universities and so on, I'd expect to see that kick up again. Um, so this is where we are, is that NAT is not a particularly attractive option. But the alternative is barely barely, barely deployed. Um, so when people ask me why should I deploy IPv6, the, the really simple answer is because that is what IPv4 is today. If you want some feature of IPv4 and want to retain that into the future, 
you're talking about deploying IPv6 simply because us ISPs are going to change the nature of IPv4 in the next three or four years. Um, the other point to be made, which is one I still wish the vendors would, would um, realise, is that nobody is going to pay money for such an insignificant feature. You know, give me what I have today. <laughs> that, that's just not going to happen. There is no money in IPv6. Um, and the belief that there is has, has really dampened the uptake of v6. For example, if you run a nice, I will mention the vendor, if you run a nice Cisco switch and you want to run IPv6, you have to move to their more expensive code stream because they see that as an advanced feature, not something you will definitely positively need in two years' time. I have a question. Oh, that's certainly true. Yeah, and, and you can see that in Simon's own strategy of offering V6 into the market very early, where he's thinking, well, I'm going to lock in the hobbyists and gamers, because um, those that aren't from Australia, Internode, are, um, I think in the US you'd call them a second tier ISP. So we have Telstra and Optus sort of holding most of the market, and then Internode and IINet um, sort of in the hurricane electric space. Um, and they're definitely aimed at the hobbyists, the early deployers, the, that sort of market. And by bringing V6 to those, they stop their customer base being attracted by cheaper plans from Telstra and Optus and so on. So yeah, I, th I think you can use it in your business strategy, without a doubt, yeah. But can you release a product and expect to have revenue come in? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to glide over this partly because of the time. I've, this is a very broad topic and I've decided to cover it in its broadness rather than in its depth. So, and equally if you want depth, we can do depth later. Um, the design for V6 is to take V4 and fix the bugs. Um, that's probably the best way of thinking about it. So most of what you know, already know about V4 just works in V6. And that's a very broad statement and we can start to pick holes in it. For a start, the addresses are larger because that was one of the goals, was to make this thing last a while. Um, back when v6 was started, people were still hard coding IPv4 addresses. This was in an era where IPX and Apple Talk would automatically configure. So automated configuration was seen as a goal. Um, related to automatic configuration is the supply of a default route. Um, and equally, if you, well, why one default route, why not two? And so there's an ability to do a default route failover. And then there's also security, or what we might call privacy and authentication, um, and quality of service. Both these two features have been backported into v4, and IPsec and um, diffserve are huge topics on their own. And if you want, I'll come back next year and discuss diffserve and leave IPsec to those people that understand it. <laughs> Um, okay, the, having made that broad sweep, the other major nit about my statement is that IPv6 is a separate protocol from IPv4. That is, it duplicates everything in v4. It has its own routing table. It has its own copy of the routing protocols. When you configure a box, that means you need to provide its own firewall rules and so on. So in that sense, you can think about it as more as an IPX or Apple Talk than IPv4+. Plus. Um, going back to my first point, the addresses are 128 bits long, which sounds a lot, except we then turn around and waste a whole stack of them. Um, it, it's to gain the auto configuration feature, which we'll get to in a tick, which is worth it, I think. Um, the traditional split, if you look at IP address, v4 addresses, is traditionally split between being a network part that I, us ISPs take care of, um, a subnet part that is your networking, and a host part, which is to enumerate machines on the subnet. Um, the split also exists in IPv6, and in a sense is more rigid. Um, the usual case is that us ISPs will allocate you a slash 48. 
The subnet will happen between 48 and 64, and there are 64 bits left for the host enumeration. Those 64 bits are enough to actually number every machine currently out there, which turns out to be the strategy. <laughs> Uh, that's true for ISPs. You won't get one of those as a customer. Um, and I'm trying to make this very customer focused. No, you said I meant 48. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Yep. Sorry. Um, I've illustrated an address here to show the parts. And you can see that the other major change in V6, which in my view is totally uncalled for, is they've massively hacked with the syntax. <laughs> um, being sysadmins, you can immediately see what it is, right? It's um, groups of hex digits separated by a colon uh, with leading zeros suppressed. Um, there's one trick, which is this double colon is used to su suppress a run of all zero double octets words, I suppose we would have used to call them, although it's a 32-bit era now. Um, and just, just to be totally, fantastically non greppable you can also <laughs> give a um, IPv4 address in a particular format, which we'll get to later. In fact, in this slide, uh, here. Uh, for some sort of reverse compatibility that isn't really defined yet. <laughs> um, the addresses you'll actually see is colon, colon, one. Uh, the, there's no place like home loopback address. Uh, which is a good choice, actually, and colon, colon, slash, zero, which is the traditional default route. Um, the rest of the multicast and so on, I'm sure you'll encounter as you encounter them. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> You can do a similar trick with V4, I think, uh, thinking about the multicast allocations. Maybe you'd need two entries in the routing table. Yeah. <laughs> Although, fortunately, multicasts are so well-defined, they're not going to go back and reap that space. Otherwise, life would be insane. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> um, yeah, especially, I, I know there shouldn't be special case code in routers for default routes, but there is. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, so what we do, as someone was saying, the incredibly wasteful use of 64 bits of uh, enumerating the host, what we do there is we take your MAC address, your 48-bit, usually Ethernet MAC address, and we shove it in those 64 bits. We do that through a special Munji algorithm called EUI64 because we want to be forward compatible with the day that Ethernet runs out of 48-bit MAC addresses. Um, well, this thing was meant to last a while. Um, although, you know, there are other changes we'd like to make to Ethernet but well before that, like increasing the default packet size. <laughs> um, that that gives you 16 bits for enumerating your site, which is, depending how you look at these things, 60 odd thousand subnets. But if you're a true networking bod like me, you'll probably use the top four bits for uh, an area address and then the bottom 12 for the actual enumeration of the subnets within that area. Aggregate at the area reg in your OSPF. And that's as much into networking as I care to go in this talk. Um, so the host part is very easy to derive. Uh, some people get rather bound up with the um, privacy consequences of this. So there are at least two hacks for solving that, one of which is think of a random number and the other one which is ha hash the MAC address. Um, but the question for the host is, since I have derived the bottom half of my address, how do I find the top half? Well, ask the router is basically the answer. The router, upon request or at a particular interval, will shove out an advertisement with the prefix. And by implication, the fact that it's a router in fact, you said a bit to say that it's a router. Um, and because there can be multiple routers on a subnet, you can listen to multiples of these, fuss gaining the feature of CARP or VRRP or HSRP very cheaply um, to your average host. 
Um, the way you configure that on your home Linux box is to run a program called RadDV with far too much configuration. Uh, in fact, um, Steve Walsh is running it. And in much the same way as running your own D DHCP server, th there is a special, very large axe we keep. <laughs> um, in fact, someone was running their own DHCP server last night by accident. They were probably running a VM or something and it escaped out and was causing endless trouble. Yeah, but everyone runs at the top priority if you actually tell people about the priorities, so I'm just skimming over that. <laughs> you know, us networking people will take care of the priorities. <laughs> Sysadmins don't need to know. Um, <laughs> the, the other really big difference about V6 is the address will hold multiple, the interface will hold multiple addresses with ease. Um, the original plan there was I'm connected to ISP A, I want to migrate to ISP B. Right? I'll have all my hosts hold multiple addresses and then I'll flick the old ones. I don't think that will actually work in practice, but the feature's there. Um, there are a couple of poor ideas that were pulled out of V6 um, on the fly fragmentation. As much the same as V4, there's an ICMP and blocking that at your firewall just really sucks. <laughs> um, people that block ISP ping, there should be a special hell for them. Especially when they ring up the ISP and say, my internet connection doesn't work. And you try and ping them and sure enough they're not there. And, you say, and they say, oh, I'm running a especially bridging firewall. <laughs> um, yeah. A whole stack of poor features are gone. Um, probably most of which you don't know about. In DNS we have a new record type. Uh, the quad A that holds the... Um, IPv6 address. The reverse is a particular classic. <laughs> um, the idea here is that you can delegate on any nibble, uh, any four bits. Um, in practice, you don't want to be typing this sucker. <laughs> um, and so that means that dynamic, um, D8, dynamic DNS, which has been a sort of small disregarded feature for some time now, I suspect is about to come to its own age <laughs> and face rather large deployment. Uh, one of the issues with these auto-configured addresses is that if you put this as the address of your web server, you're going to have problems if the MAC address fails or you swap out a machine or something. Um, probably the best thing to do there is to stamp the, um, the new MAC card with the um, old MAC's address and have two MAC addresses on the name. Uh. No, no, no. The, the better thing to do is to give the service its own address, right? The problem with that is a lot of applications will not bind to another address. Um, I mean, things like Apache will, but I mean applications like Microsoft Mail Servers. <laughs> uh, right? And so if you're an apps author, this feature would be very handy. I've already made this point. The other thing DNS does is do the migration. Um, when your machine is running IPv6, it will, the resolver stack, will ask for a quad A record before it asks for an A record. And that's the sole migration mechanism, uh, which is all you need, really. This thing comes unstuck a bit, thanks to people that hard code IPv4 addresses in um, web pages, but there's already a special hell for those people anyway. Uh, the other thing to note is that there's um, DNS lookups can occur over v4 or v6, right? They're just database lookups. They don't particularly care what the transport is. It, you can actually use ChaosNet even to look them up, which would be truly perverse. Okay. Um, and I have, I believe, how long to go? I'm just trying, half an hour? Excellent. Okay, so we can probably take some questions if people have any questions about the technical aspects of the thing. Yep, that's good. Well, either way, there's plenty of opportunity for us ISPs to go and retrieve those. I'm sorry. The, the question was, only about a third of addresses are advertised. 
uh, which is quite true. Um, the question is how many of those non-advertised non addresses are recoverable? And the answer we don't know. And it's probably related to the amount of money we wave in front of them. Um, and that comes back to will you pay $1,000 for an IP address or will you pay 10 you know, So we really don't know how much money it's going to take to shift that. Yeah, I, I, I should have said moving above curve. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how much I buy that. Um, we already have DHCP snooping on enterprise switches as a, as a feature to come at that. And I think that's probably more hackable than a, an approach where the switch is continually reminded of, of the upstream addresses and where the switch full knows what the host allocated downstream address should be because it's, it's seen its MAC address. Uh, I'm genuinely not sure uh, in, in an enterprise scenario um, as opposed to, you know, big bridge VLAN like this one um, as to how, how that will work out. Um, it may turn out that, you know, there's some features that make it more hackable and it may turn out the other way. Yeah, I, I think, and this comes back to the difference between specification and implementation. You can actually secure the RAD DV advertisements with IPsec, but no one does. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, I have 20 minutes with slides on that, so, <laughs> yes? Oh, most certainly. Um, I'm not sure what the Linux Conf AU rules are, but I just whack GFDL on it. If that doesn't meet the rules, I'll whack something else on it. Um, that's probably a reflection of gamers hating Nat, rather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fair point. Um, okay, I was asked about deployment plans, and there is, in fact, a deployment plan here. Um, all good plans start with paperwork, sadly. And so what you do is you go to your ISP and say, give me a V6 address, and unless you get, belong to one of two ISPs in Australia, the answer will be, what's that? <laughs> um, and then what you do is you don't fight it, right? Please don't fight it. Use a slash 64 for each subnet, <laughs> right? Um, use the 16 bits for subnetting, right? These things are pretty much fixed, uh, are more fixed in v6 than they are in v4, right? And if you do unusual things, it will bite you on the bottom like you wouldn't believe. Um, we've had a couple of customer sites try that, thinking they're large universities and know better than everyone else, and they've come unstuck and gone back to the one true way. Um, the next thing to do is basically the deployment is from the inside, the core of your network to the edges. So the next step is bring it up from the link on the ISP. Depending on your ISP, it will already be up because they'll default route it. Or alternatively, they'll BGP it. The BGP is very straightforward. All you need to do is um, run up MBGP, set up another address family, and put a network statement in, exactly as you do for v4 now except, of course, with colons rather than dots. Um, bring up v6 across your corporate backbone is the next step. Now, for these link addresses, 
lots of people use slash 64s because there's so many of them. Uh, it's probably wiser in the long run to choose 164 for all the li link addresses in your network and just go with slash 126s um, and just go with point to points through the network. <coughs> on routers, you should not use EUI 64 on router router interfaces because those addresses end up all the way through the router config and other routers configs and all sorts of places and you really want a hard coded address, colon one for one end, colon two for the other. Um, when you bring up, for the same reason, when you bring up EUI64 into user subnets, it's still worth using colon colon one for the router address. That's a MAC address that, that that's an EUI64 address that no host is going to have and so it's safe for your router to use and if you have to change your router card or move people to another interface, that can be done without people saying, seeing a change of router address. Um, the next thing to do is to bring up all the usual bump. Um, you're going to have to run up a stateless DHCP server. This is a DHCP server for v6 only that hands out networking information but does not record anything that it's handed out. That's what stateless means. It hands out the same answer to every similar query. Um, no, it's a slightly different thing. Um, again, dynamic D DNS for the average host. This is something new as a sysadmin you're going to have to deploy. Um, it's a good opportunity to deploy these services on any cast addresses as opposed to fixed addresses. So if you want to move them around in your network later, and it's very easy to do so. I won't talk about any cast here. Somebody last year talked about any cast in V4. Same thing for V6. Um, the next thing to do is to find your computer science department at a university or to find the IT section itself for um, a, a happy group of users and make them unhappy. <laughs> And that will show up all the internal applications that don't work with V6 that you thought you'd already covered. Um, and then you'll be in a mood to transition the public facing services. These are usually very easy. Apache is good, Bind is good, um, Sendmail and Postfix and the rest of them are good. There's only one fly in that ointment and that's that thing. And squid. Hey, I'm shocked, sorry. <laughs> Beat myself off the floor. Um, some of the monitoring tools were dragging their feet, but I think even Nagios and so on are now fully with the program. And then you do the masses. Um, usually that needs to another round of fighting with what we call middle boxes, firewalls and load sharers and all that sort of stuff, because they're the networking components that are lagging in V6 support. Uh, VPN dial-in servers, all the accounting trash that isn't routers. And the biggest issue there is if you do traffic accounting, the format for traffic accounting is going to change. Most people use NetFlow for that, and the NetFlow format changes um, to a thing called IP fix. Um, it moves from um, being um, one record per flow to being aggregated. Um, so if you're using it for intrusion detection, that's a real problem. Um, there's a stack of changes around the meta networking level that bite you at this stage. Um, then you've got to go and have a long, serious talk with your applications programmers about V6 support. Um, when you talk to a programmer saying, I want you to upgrade SAP so it supports IPv6, what do you think the application programmer's view of that is? <laughs> I could have used PeopleSoft as the example. And as somebody who likes to get paid through either of those systems, <laughs> You know, it's a real... No? I thought you had a question. Um, so you can see that there's a real disconnect here in time frames. Um, and there, finish it off. But this is a survey done by Casey Claffey, who works for Aaron, of why people haven't moved to V6 yet. And the thing that struck me about this is you can put a line about there and say the top four major issues are management issues. I'm being broad here. And all the minor issues, again, being broad, are technical issues. 
And so most of the things about V6 are not technical issues, right? Um, and I suspect a lot of them are actually fear of change. You know, it's a long time since people ran IPX and Apple Talk, and they're just not used to running multiple protocols anymore. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yes. Our federal government, sorry, Australia's federal government has an IPv6. The, the, for the record, the statement was that the Australian government believes that there are too many unknown IPv6. It's like an unknown unknown. Yes, it's the unknown unknowns. <laughs> um, I hope it goes better than yeah, the Iraq thing. <laughs> uh, and it is a good point. Um, but, I mean, the, the flip side of that is there are universities and so on running the thing. And um, if you think the federal government is hack as a hacker target, you have not worked in a university. <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, the federal government is very. I'm being aware I'm taped, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're they're very bifurcated on this issue, right? Um, and you've got to be careful about who in the federal government you talk about. There are risk-averse sections of the federal government, and I would put um, DSD and so on in that category. And there are sections of the federal government that are responsible for Australia's economic policy who are going, hang on, everybody's about to be screwed over by IPv4 NAT. We want to support this V6 thing, right? So depending on where you are in the spectrum of government, and, and so I think saying the federal government believes something is a real problem given the complexity of federal government. Yeah. And... The, the, the federal government, there's the Department of Finance that's currently writing um, a policy for government departments on the deployment of V6. The only problem with that, of course, is it's four years too late. Um, by the time that gets finished, they won't be able to be deployed in a reasonable time, um, and that ISPs that take the bite and offer V6 won't be able to, the, you know, there's no drive for the customers to say, well, at least you can access federal government services. Well, no. <laughs> Um, and so on. Ten minutes? Excellent. Um, I've already talked about the trickle-down effect where us ISPs put this thing in on one weekend, you take two months to roll it out through Apache and so on, and then we kick the application programmers on for a year or two. Um, one thing you can do to solve that is to grab a tunnel from a tunnel broker. Uh, we offer one of those for free. Um, and you can use that yourself to get experience with V6, but also to pass on V6 to your apps people to get them started, right? Because as we know, apps changes and apps development take a long time, and then you've got acceptance testing. And so by the, if they can do that with a tunnel, then hopefully you'll have native by the time they finish. Uh, we have a major problem with that box, and I'm sick and tired of it, so we'll replace it. The major deployment issue with V6, in my experience, has been the colons. Right? For one tiny little design mistake <laughs> has caused endless trouble. Right? The reason is this. You're an apps programmer or a Perl programmer or something like that. IPv4, regular format. Apple Talk, regular format. IPX, regular format. DECnet, regular format. Ethernet, regular format, right? Network addresses, by definition, have a regular format. IPv6, no. <laughs> yep, yep, and, and so you can escape that with a square bracket, right? But then the wiki software uses that square bracket to mean embedded URL. <laughs> and so the whole thing just escalates, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry? No, too late. Horse bolted. Classic example of network people designing for themselves, saving themselves some typing, stuffing everyone else about. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So what that means in practice is that if you're looking at stuff that manipulates IPv addresses, then you're talking about rewriting functions rather than putting in one-liners, which is a real pain, really. Um, the other point is this point up here. It's a different address family. So where you currently hold a blurb saying IP address, you may have to change that to be IP address family, IP address, depending on your application, right? Because you may or may not care about this distinction. Um, all right, security, we've already discussed a bit. The biggest problem with security is that it's a different protocol. And the absolute classic here was Cisco's peeps. <laughs> where you could enable IPv6 and traffic would go through. <laughs> and it would automatically enable it if it saw IPv6 upstream. <laughs> there are still some boxes like that out there. Um, but the the vendor um, fixed that particular bug. Thank you. Um, and firewalls and other middle boxes are the problem, right? Routers and so on aren't too bad. Switches, unless you particularly need features like um, DHCP verification, um, snooping, um, or the equivalent of that in V6. Um, yeah, it's the middle boxes. So, as designers, if if you can avoid middle boxes for this interim period, if you have the choice between load sharing and anycast, or DNS round robin, um, if that will do the job, use that, right? Um, try and minimize the amount of middle boxes in this interim period. Uh, monitoring, because of the way we look up quad A addresses, and then look up A addresses, it's quite possible that um, somebody will be advertising V6 reachability, but not delivering on that advertisement, right? In which case, the user's traffic will black hole for V6 addresses. Whereas a V4 user will go along just fine because I'll look up the A address and they'll go. So all your monitoring systems need to be updated so that Nagios looks at their A and the quad A and tries the V4 and the V6 connection to every service that you monitor. Which means, of course, when it breaks, you get two alarms. <laughs> um, coming back to what someone said about configuration control, we have a similar... Um, issue in networking, that is there is none outside of large ISPs. And so when you ask people to go and make a change on every box on their network, they go, oh! <laughs> rather than go, oh yeah, sure. Uh, and that, to my mind, is the biggest problem, right? This is what makes network engineers say, I don't want to do that. And so if you're contracting to an organization and you're putting in change control for their systems, if you extend that to the network, that you'd be doing them a big favour. Um, traffic accounting, I've already discussed. Discuss that. XP, we'll skip. Um, my own sector is um, not immune from the problem. I know of one university, the ANU, that actually shows students an IPv6 address, despite the fact that all students graduating will see a v6 address during their career. Uh, vendor training, those at Red Hat and Microsoft, is no better. Okay, so I've reached the end on time, as people. Um, so, yep, to summarise, well, there'll be a couple of minutes of questions for sure. Um, V4, as it is today, is coming to an end, right? In five years' time, for sure, you will not be able to buy a V4 service as we know it today for a reasonable price. ISP's response to that will be to offer IPv4 NAT to the average home user and to small business. If you want to escape that, you will pay. And it's unclear how much you will pay. Um, V6, the way around the problems with NATs, has very limited deployment. Um, even though ISPs could throw it out tomorrow, plus minus. Um, that, in turn, is just shifting the problems to sysadmins and then sy applications authors. Um, of course, we don't, as network engineers, mind doing that having suffered at some system administrator's hands for a number of years. <laughs> um, questions? Uh, the, it seems there's a couple of uh, unstated assumptions in what you've presented, and I, I'm really not trolling. I've never heard anyone who's advocating IPv6 give me satisfactory answers, so I, I'll ask them and let's see how we go. The first is that... Uh, for a, an extended period, 
this interim period might exceed the lifetime of every person in this room, where both protocols are run side by side on the public networks. That's which means that the NAT. Okay, fifteen years. All right. Doesn't that mean that the NAT, the NAT costs that you're talking about, are going to be incurred anyway? It depends what applications you want to run. A web server. <coughs> web server, you'll be fine, although you may have to host that at the ISP, and it will cost you more. Oh yes, yes. No, not to get to. What I'm just trying to do in this talk is not say is NAT or V6, but say this is what the landscape is going to look like going forward. Right. right? I, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, and that's what the landscape would look like. It would look like IPv4 NAT, and some ISPs offering V6, um, probably to the hobbyist and gamer market, and to. Enterprises that wish to run video conferencing and other find your partner type applications. Oh yeah, yeah. Th there is no escape from this for the ISP. Th there, yeah, there is no escape from the cost of NAT for the ISP. Yeah, the 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 economic issue is the economics to the customer. Right? The fact that you might be happily running your own web server and email at home, and we will take that away from you. Right? That, and the fact that we might use our power over deep packet inspection to alter the economics of the ISP market. Remember, the ISP market at the moment is a low-rent transport, and telcos do not like low-rent transports. Right? They want to be selling the cricket. Right? That is their dream. It's a pointless dream. But that is their dream. They want to sell access to information at the, the, at the marginal price people are willing to pay for that information. They don't want to be a low rent transport, right? This is, I mean, th these are companies that when X500 was at its peak wanted to charge a dollar for every X500 lookup, right? <laughs> they, you know, um, and if you give some telcos an opportunity, they will attempt, and probably unsuccessfully, to return to that sort of walled garden scenario where you pay a lot for each marginal service you use. Right? And that's not the market they're in at the moment, and they wouldn't mind escaping from that. And NAT, the deployment of the NAT infrastructure gives them an opportunity to move out of low rent transport. All right. Um, I see the broker running for a while, especially after I've paid five digits, no, actually six digits to upgrade it. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that, that broker is, um, that broker's got over 7,000 users, right? Um, as the interest in V6 grows, that will have a lot more. Um, it's the highest used piece of networking equipment, you know, that maintains sessions that we have which is a bit frightening. <laughs> um, and that's why it's failing, to be honest, is that it's just exceeded what the software on that box is capable of. Um, and we will fix that. And what I expect will happen is that we will use it in the sense it's being used now. And then as time progresses, we'll use it in the reverse sense and have IPv6 only sites using it for IPv4 transition. So uh, the reason I'm willing to pay so much for it is because I see that piece of equipment lasting seven years. Yeah, vote with your wallet. Um, you know, buy a kit from people that support V6 in their ADSL router and g use ISPs that offer native V6. And, ask your and yes, ask your ISP. They're all saying there is no demand.
Yeah. Yeah, well, we, the next mirror refresh will move that to V6. And because V6 traffic is free over internet currently, I expect um, that will make a lot of universities very happy. No. 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 Oh, I, I'm being very short. We used to run a 6 to 4 relay. It ran out of puff at 2,500 users. Well, we just toss it and bought another box. Um, if you remove that, one of the things we found internally is when you remove maps, if you're asking for a change in the attack surface, it gets everyone all excited. Uh, yeah, and, and I think people need to be aware that NAT, one of the, the slides I skipped on the benefits of NAT is it's widely deployed deep packet inspection firewalls. Uh, and there's nothing to stop you running a deep packet inspection firewall with a V6 connection with real addresses either side. Um, and that would, I as a home user, that would be a wise thing to do. Yep, all yours. <laughs>